going to be Matthew chapter 11. And we're going to look at what a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Proverbs 18.24 it says, A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. John 15, 13 says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Jesus Christ is the best friend that you've got. But let's look at Matthew chapter 11 and verse 1. And it came to pass when Jesus had made an end of commanding his twelve disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. Now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples, and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? So he sends two of, dis two of his disciples to Jesus to ask him if Jesus is truly the one that should come, that's prophesied in the Old Testament, or do we just need to go ahead and look for somebody else? And that's exactly what people are doing today. They begin to look for another. And 2 Corinthians 11.3 says, But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another, Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which you have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted, you might bear where you might well bear with him. So he's asking, Do we look for another? People have begun to look for another Jesus today. Uh, they have quit worshiping the Jesus of the Bible. And they've got one that's completely different. The world's gotten another Jesus. The churches have gotten another Jesus. Many Christians have gotten another Jesus. But me and you know this isn't the same Jesus because he's our friend. You know your friend. And he wrote you 66 letters telling you all about him. And if you've read the Bible, you've grown in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And when a counterfeit shows up, you know one when you see it. And they don't have the same Jesus. We know that it, if it's the same Jesus Christ, that he would do the things that he did in these 66 letters. And in Acts 1.11, it says, Which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. He's going to do things. This, he's going to come back just like that. He doesn't change. 2,000 years later, this same Jesus is coming in like manner as they've seen him go. 2,000 years have passed, and he's still the same yesterday, today, and forever. If you have familiarized yourself with the scriptures, then you know your friend. You can spot a counterfeit when you see one. And a tribulation saint will know the Antichrist isn't this same Jesus because this that fake Jesus won't come in like manner. Uh, the fake friend we see in churches today is not operating in like manner as our friend that we read about in the scriptures. But what kind of friend is Jesus? He's a friend with proof. A lot of people say they're your friend, but there's no proof. John is in prison, and he's starting to get a little offended. Maybe even wrestling with a little bit of doubt. And he sends his disciples to ask Jesus, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? But Jesus is a friend with proof. So in Matthew eleven four, Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which you do hear and see. Go and show John again. You see, he'll do it again for you. He's the same now as then. It's the same Jesus. Jesus performs these signs in front of John's disciples. He knows the Jews require a sign. 
before 1 Corinthians one twenty two has even been written. And he says in verse 5, The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, and the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Jesus Christ is a friend with proof. He is the Messiah with scripture to back it. And Jesus does these miracles to prove to the Jews that he's the promised one that's fulfilling the scriptures. And see, these Jews require a son. So he has to come with these miracles. In Isaiah 35, 5 through 6, it says, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as an heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing, for in the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert. Jesus Christ is pretty much letting John know that he is who he says he is, and he has sympathy on him because he's suffering persecution for his namesake. John is. He doesn't want John to be offended because of the situation that he's in. So he says, Blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. And every Christian will eventually be offended. John was, Paul was, and in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty nine, Paul said, Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is offended and I burn not? Paul was definitely offended. John was in prison for preaching against Herod, having his brother's wife. And he's wondering, is Jesus the one that should come, or do we look for another? Jesus Christ gives him proof and shows him that he's a friend with proof, and he shows him that he's a friend in prison. So John's in prison. John came preaching the kingdom of heaven. He was looking forward to the kingdom, not the cross. He was expecting Jesus Christ to take over and set up the kingdom on earth. Now he's in prison and Jesus Christ and his followers are being persecuted by the religious crowd. John was getting a little impatient. He's trying to hurry up the process here. But the whole time, the Lord was with him in prison. The Apostle Paul counted it an honor to be called a prisoner of Jesus Christ. And in Philemon in verse 9, Paul says, Yet for love's sake I rather beseech thee, being such an one as Paul the aged, who now also and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. The Lord will be with you in prison, just like he is at home. Don't be offended if you suffer persecution for his name. Be happy about it. The man, uh, Richard Wormbrandt, preached Jesus in prison, and he said if you were caught preaching in prison, then you received a severe, a severe beating. Uh, he decided to pay the price for the privilege of preaching, so it was a deal. He said, we preached and they beat us. We were happy preaching. They were happy beating us. So everyone was happy. He's like the disciples. In Acts 5.41, it says, And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Your friend will go with you to prison. And in Genesis 39.20, that's what he did with Joseph. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in the prison, but the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord is not only with you in prison, but he took your hell on the cross, which is called prison, and, and he went down to hell, because he took your hell on the cross, and hell is a prison. When he was in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights, he preached to the spirits, in prison. In Matthew eleven seven, it says, And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, What went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? Notice that Jesus Christ doesn't bash his preacher friend John the Baptist, even though he's in prison. He doesn't have anything negative to say about John, even though John asked the question, Should we look for another? He says John wasn't a reed shaken with the wind. He he wasn't going to, you know, John wasn't going to say he was sorry for preaching Jesus Christ even though he was in prison now. He wasn't a reed shaken with the wind. Jesus says in Matthew eleven eight, But what went ye out for to see, a man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. John didn't have soft raiment. He had on a leather girdle and wore camel's hair. Uh, he wasn't getting the best dressed award. Uh, half the preachers wouldn't let him preach because he, 
He doesn't even own a suit and a tie. It says in verse 25, Luke 7, 25, But what went ye out for to see, a man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they which are gorgeously apparelled and live delicately are in king's courts. The Lord not only doesn't bash John while he's in prison, but he compliments him, and that's a true friend. He describes how much of a rough character that John is. He says, But what went ye out for to see, a prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet. John was more than a prophet. He wasn't just any prophet. He was the forerunner of Jesus Christ. He wasn't just any prophet. He would have been the second coming of Elijah if Israel would have received Jesus Christ. Jesus said in Matthew 11:10, For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. John is the one of whom it is written. In Malachi 3, 1, a prophecy about John, it says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare thy, the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the com covenant whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. And then in Isaiah 40 and verse 3, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. John is much more than just a prophet. He's prophesied in the Old Testament. He's the forerunner of Jesus Christ. He he did no miracle. He, he didn't use nothing but his preaching. And the Lord speaks highly of believers, even during times of their weakness. And that is, if you interpret John as being weak right here, as in the sense of doubting, I'm not exactly sure of John's feelings in the moment. But in Matthew 11, 11, it says, Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Imagine having the Lord say this about you specifically. He's not just any prophet. Among those born of women, there, th there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. But if you're born again, your new nature isn't born of women. You are born of God, and you are a son of God. So when it says, among those born of women, there's not risen a greater than John the Baptist, your new nature is not born of women. You see, John wasn't born again. He wasn't a son of God. He was a friend of the bridegroom, which is Jesus. Your new man in you is greater than John the Baptist because it has the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And those in the future kingdom of heaven, the millennial kingdom on earth, are greater than he. That should tell you what it's going to be like in the millennium. They will have the law wrote in their hearts and in their mind. They will see the glor glorified Lord Jesus Christ on the throne. They won't have to be preaching and be persecuted all the time. There will be no doubt about who Jesus is because you'll be able to go to Jerusalem and see him right there on the throne. So in that sense... When you get to that kingdom of heaven, everyone there is going to be greater than John the Baptist. And what kind of world that will be. In Hebrews 10, 16, it says, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And in Matthew eleven twelve, it says, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. This shows you the kingdom of heaven is a physical kingdom that you can see. It's just not It's not talking about heaven where God is. It's talking about a physical kingdom on this earth. And the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence. The violent take it by force. It's a physical thing. Remember, the kingdom of God is different. It's a spiritual kingdom that you can't see. For example, in Luke 17, 20, it says, And when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. And in Romans 14, 17, it says, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the whole of the ghost. It's not a physical thing that you can touch. It's not something that comes with observation. It's something you can't see. And sometimes the kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven are mentioned interchangeably, 
This isn't because they're the same. It's because our best friend is the king of both kingdoms. And when he's here, they're both here. And when he's on this earth, both kingdoms are present. When we go into the millennium, both kingdoms will just come together. You'll have Jesus reigning over a physical kingdom on earth. There's your kingdom of heaven. And there will be millions of born-again believers of, of the body of Christ on earth running with them in glorified bodies. There's your kingdom of God. Matthew eleven twelve, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Jesus Christ is a friend with proof. He proved to John with all the miracles that he did, showing him that those verses... Uh, about those miracles, the the uh, blind receiving their sight, and things like that. He was doing that, proving that he is that person promised from the Old Testament. He's a friend of John in prison. John was put in prison for preaching to Herod, and Jesus proves that he's a, still a friend even when John's in prison. He's not bashing him. He's even complimenting him and saying there's not a, among those born of women, there's not risen a greater than John the Baptist. And the next thing, he's a friend during prophecy unfolding. The Lord is about to explain to John. He's about to explain how John will fulfill prophecies about Elijah coming back if the Jews will receive Jesus Christ in his kingdom. In Matthew eleven thirteen, it says, for all, the prof for all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And this marks an obvious division in scripture. For all those who do not believe that there are divisions, here is an obvious division. You see, a lot of people believe that from Genesis 1-1 all the way to the end of the Bible, there are no divisions. Everybody is just doing the same thing, operating the same way, and that's just not true. Here are plain divisions that can be concluded just from this verse. It says, And the law prophesied until John. Well, we know that there was a time before the law then because in John 1 17 it says for the law was given by Moses but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ so you have a time before the law if there was a time before the law that shows the law started somewhere the law of Moses the law was given by Moses started somewhere so that's a plain division you have a time during the law I can most of the Old Testament. There's another plain division. Uh, all the law, all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. There's another division. The time of John the Baptist and Jesus Christ's earthly ministry seems to be its own little uh, dispensation. Then we know the New Testament doesn't even officially start until Jesus dies on the cross because Hebrews 9.16 shows you that a, a testament doesn't start until the death of the testator. And this is where they, this is where they get in the way for the body, the way to get into the body of Christ was made possible. And it says in Ephesians 2.16, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, showing you that people before the cross could not even get in the body of Christ. That's a plain division there. And then the other ones. Uh, you have a time of transition after the cross in the book of Acts. And this is where Israel gets one final shot at accepting Jesus Christ. Of course, they reject Stephen's message in Acts 7. So the church age becomes an official thing after that fact. This doesn't mean the body of Christ started in Acts 7. But the option was open for the church age to never take place up until Acts 7. If the Jews would have received Jesus. And since the Jews rejected, the kingdom is postponed. And this gives us a parenthetical period of time called the church age. And during this time, Israel is blind in part. And then when the body of Christ is complete, you'll have the rapture of the church. And then comes Daniel's 70th week, where God will once again deal with Israel. After this, you have the millennium. Then the ages of ages and eternity. So you got all these plain divisions. Uh, this verse here. Matthew eleven thirteen shows us at least four of them. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. Showing you there is a time 
before the law, a time during the law, a time during the time of John the Baptist, and then obviously we know a time after Jesus Christ died on the cross, the New Testament. So right there was that you could get out of this one verse, you can see four plain divisions, and getting other a few other verses in there, you can see even more plain divisions in the scriptures. But those are just some of the more obvious ones. And Matthew eleven thirteen says, For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. Our friend Jesus Christ is a prophet like unto Moses. He's our friend in prophecy unfolding. He never skipped out on any of the prophecies. All the Old Testament prophecies that are about him came to pass. All the prophecies he gives during his earthly ministry will come to pass. And he says if they will receive it, receive the kingdom, then John the Baptist is Elijah. But they didn't receive it. Therefore, Elijah still has to come back in the tribulation time period before the coming and dreadful day of the Lord. And you read about him in Revelation 11 as one of those two witnesses. And it says in Malachi 4, 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And this is one of the reasons I don't believe that the, the three and a half years of Jesus' earthly ministry fulfilled the first part of Daniel's 70th week. The things that would have been fulfilled by the Jews accepting Jesus as Messiah didn't get fulfilled, even though they were in place to be fulfilled. For example, like John becoming Elijah, or like John being Elijah. Uh, they, re they didn't receive Jesus, so therefore Elijah still has to come back. So these things must be fulfilled during that future time period. It says in Matthew eleven fifteen, He that has ears to hear... Let him hear. If you have a really good friend in this life, when he talks, you listen. When our best friend talks, the Lord Jesus, you need to pay attention. He always says, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. He's looking for somebody to hear him. He's a friend during prophecy unfolding. Jesus is a friend with priority straight. It says in verse 16, But whereunto shall I liken this generation? It is like unto children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows. Calling unto their fellows. A feller is someone who chopped down trees. It's someone who hews or knocks down. So when they hung out, I guess they would call each other feller. feller. In, in, in the South, a lot of times, you know, people, people don't refer to me by name. They say, that little feller over there. Or they say, uh, who's this feller? Uh, the saying came from the Bible. Then I guess it turned into fellows. A more proper way to say it, I guess. In verse 16, But whereunto shall I liken this generation? It's like unto children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows and saying, We have piped unto you and ye have not danced. We have mourned unto you and ye have not lamented. He's saying the generation is childish. They're like children sitting in the markets. Uh, mad at people for not dancing as they popped, and mad at the people for not lamenting as they mourned. As believers, we don't get excited and dance at the things that the world does. We don't get mournful and lament over the same things that they do. So they pipe unto us, and we don't dance. They mourn unto us, and we don't lament. We got different priorities. They have different priorities than we do. Our friend has different priorities than the world does and if you hang around the devil's friends more than you do jesus friends your priorities will get crooked for example i get a thousand times more excited over a, a brand new bible wide margin bible than i would a, a, an nfl game now the world wouldn't understand that i get a lot more grieved over the death of a lost sinner that i don't even know than i would about my own pet dying the world doesn't look at things like that. They would be more close to their pet dog and be more concerned about a pet dog dying than they would a, a lost sinner dying of whom they don't even know. But if you hang around Jesus, you'll wind up with better priorities. Your mind will begin to think eternally and not temporally. Jesus is a friend with priorities straight. 
Jesus is a friend of publicans and sinners. You know how in high school some people wouldn't be associated with you because you didn't have the right clothes or the car or the right family? Jesus isn't like that. He'll eat with anybody. He would be so lenient about who he ate with that the cool kids made fun of him, the Pharisees. They would accuse him of sinning and participating in sinful activities because the publicans and sinners sat down with him and he didn't even get up and move. Just because you're eating with somebody doesn't mean you're doing what they're doing. Just because you knock on the drug dealer's door doesn't mean you're getting drugs. The Pharisees made fun of John and falsely accused him. His ministry was a bit different than Jesus' ministry. He was more ultra-separated. He didn't eat with publicans and sinners. Since he was like Elijah, he probably didn't really eat with anybody. But he probably ate out there in the wilderness, and the ravens probably brought him locusts, dipped in honey. Uh, but this is what John and the Lord's accusers said about them. In Matthew eleven eighteen, it says, For John came neither eating nor drinking. And they say, he hath the devil. So the first thing you're going to notice is that accusers lie. Do you know what the devil is called in Revelation 12.10? The accuser of the brethren. Just because someone said something doesn't make it true. Just because someone said something in the Bible doesn't mean God approves of what they said. For example, when the serpent said to Eve, Thou shalt not surely die, the Bible recorded it. And it recorded it exactly as the serpent said it. But that doesn't mean it wasn't a lie. The Bible is the truth. But it also records the things that sinful men say. That the devil says. What the father of life says. When they said John hath the devil. That was a lie. They really said it. It really happened. The Bible recorded it as it said it. The Holy Spirit gave you the truth. Of what, the jo of what John the Baptist was filled with. It gave you the truth of what they said he was filled with. And the Holy Spirit told you in Luke one fifteen that he was filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. That is the statement concerning John from the Holy Spirit. Who should we believe, the Spirit or the Pharisees? They're saying he's he hath the devil. The Holy Spirit told us he was filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. Now what did they say about Jesus? In verse 19, well we already know they lied about John. So you can expect them to lie about Jesus. They said, The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners, but wisdom is justified of her children. When Jesus came eating and drinking, this doesn't mean he came drinking fermented alcohol. That is just what his accusers were saying. What did they say? Behold, a man gluttonous and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. You say, Why would they call him a wine-bibber if he wasn't drinking? Drinking strong drink. Well, why would they call him gluttonous? If these things are true about Jesus Christ, then the Bible is in error, and he wasn't sinless. And if these things are true, then he would have been stoned under the law in Deuteronomy 21.20. 20. And they shall say unto the elders of his city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. They're basically calling Jesus a sinner. When Jesus came eating and drinking with publicans and sinners, this doesn't mean he was drinking strong drink. Why would he do these type of things when the scriptures forbid it? In Proverbs 20 and verse 1, it says, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. So is Jesus not wise? Was he deceived? You see, Solomon wrote that in Proverbs 20 and verse 1. And you know something about our friend is that when he came on the scene, he said, A greater than Solomon is here. Solomon had enough wisdom to know strong drink is wrong. So the Lord has enough wisdom and understanding to know it's wrong and not to do it. So if you're one of these people going around saying, Jesus drank alcohol to justify yourself drinking it, then you're way off. Not to mention there are two kinds of wine in the Bible, old wine and new wine. In Isaiah 65, 8 says, New wine is found in the cluster. It's just grape juice. And in Proverbs 3, 10, it says, Show, So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy pre presses shall burst out with new wine. New wine is grape juice. It can't be fermented when it busts out of the presses. 
Uh, Jesus did eat with publicans and sinners. Uh, do you know who Jesus came to save? Sinners. The ones accusing him didn't really believe they were sinners. In Matthew 21, 32, it says, For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him. And ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward, that ye might believe him. You can look at people who are drunks, druggies, fornicators, and they look really bad in the flesh. But most times they receive a message of truth a lot better than the religious crowd like the Pharisees. The Pharisees thought they were better than they were. They were self-righteous. But Jesus is a friend of publicans and sinners. He would have been a friend of the Pharisees. He was their friend. He, he died for them too. But they rejected him. The next thing is Jesus is a friend who preaches at me. Everybody has a friend that always gives them advice or tries to tell them how to fix things in their life. Most times that is the person that cares about you more than anybody else. And many times you'll say, okay, I get it. Now quit preaching at me. Jesus Christ should be your main friend who preaches at you and preaches at me. When I read the Bible, that's Jesus preaching at me. In Matthew eleven twenty, it says, Then began he to upbraid the cities wherein most of the mighty works were done, because they repented not. So he is upbraiding the cities. That means to charge with something wrong or disgraceful. And you as a sinner are eventually going to do something wrong or disgraceful. And Jesus went through doing all these mighty works, and still they repented not in these cities. Many times a lost person can have numerous miracles and close calls and still the goodness of God didn't lead them to repentance. They just kept on in unbelief. Maybe they wrecked and it was a miracle that they didn't die. Maybe they had cancer. It was a miracle they didn't die. But they just keep on in unbelief. Many times a saint can get out in the world and the Lord just keeps whipping him and being long-suffering with him and he still repents not. He never gets back in fellowship. All I can say is woe unto you. That is what our friend says as he's preaching at you. He says, Woe unto thee, Chorazin. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. If Tyre and Sidon would have had Jesus Christ preaching and healing all over the place, they would have repented a long time ago. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. Once again, we see there are going to be different degrees of punishment given out at the judgment. This could be, this could apply to the judgment of the nations in terms of locations being judged, which takes place right before Jesus sets up his kingdom. Or it could also be referring to the great white throne judgment, which take, takes place after the millennium, and this is for individuals. So, Chorazin and Bethsaida had the preaching of mighty works of Jesus before their eyes. It won't be very tolerable for them at the judgment. He says, And thou Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shalt be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained unto this day. Capernaum exalted themselves. That's what the devil did in Isaiah 14. He said, I will exalt myself. And it says, And now Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. That's what he said about the devil. You shall be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. And Sodom, if Sodom had the mighty works that were done in Capernaum, they would have never been burned down. The Lord would have never had to rain fire and brimstone on them. It says in Matthew eleven twenty four, But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. More tolerable for a bunch of violent sex perverts like Sodom than for a bunch of religious hypocrites who see Jesus Christ work miracles and still reject him. So the sin of unbelief is even worse than sex perversion. Jesus never ceased to preach the truth on hell and on judgment. There was no holding back. He was a, a friend who preaches and he's a friend of plain men. In Mark 12, 37, it says, And the common people heard him gladly. He's a friend of common 
ordinary everyday people the plain common ordinary average everyday person that you run into would hear jesus gladly it was the worldly wise smart philosophizing geniuses who didn't like the lord you'll find that the best preachers are common men who don't try to sound smart Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2, 4, My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. In Matthew eleven thirty five, it says, At that time Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. You see, God hides some things from the wise and prudent, the worldly wise people. God wants it so simple that a child can get it. Sure, he throws some deep stuff in the scriptures that causes you to study, but the common man can study and learn the deep stuff. It doesn't take a genius. It isn't made in a way that you have to be a genius to grasp it. The Lord Jesus is glad that things had been hidden from the wise and prudent and revealed unto babes. And if you open the Bible and read it and believe it, then you're going to be a lot smarter and wiser than the college professors who, Romans one twenty two says professing professing themselves to be wise they became fools the smarter they thought they were the dumber they got and in matthew eleven twenty six, it says even so father for so it seemed good in thy sight all things are delivered unto me of my father and no man knoweth the son but the father neither knoweth any man the father save the son and he to whomsoever the son will reveal him without jesus christ you can't know the father and if you deny the father then you don't know the son in 1 John 2, 22 and 23, it says, Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is any Christ that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father, but he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Unless Jesus Christ reveals it to you, you don't know the Father. Without Jesus Christ, you can't know God, because Jesus is God. And in John 14, 6 through 7, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, you, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. You see, you can't have one way out without the other. It's the Godhead. First John 5, 7, The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, these three are one. If you deny the Son, you deny the Father. If you deny the Father, you deny the Son. No man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Jesus Christ showed you the Father. Jesus is a friend who persuades. And in Matthew eleven twenty eight it says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. People are heavy laden. You go you just go out to town, to the store, you see people, the look on their faces, they're heavy laden. They look weak, they look tired, they look depressed, they look sick, they look sin sick. It's because the way of transgressors is hard, Proverbs thirteen five. You see the celebrities without the makeup on, they look rough. It's because the way of transgressors is hard. Nobody out there, even the people on TV who you think look good, everybody's looking pretty rough. People are heavy laden. Because they haven't laid aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. As it says in Hebrews 12, 1, they're weighed down with their sin. But our friend says, come unto me, and he can take the weight off of you. It's nothing for him. He He's going to carry the government on his shoulders. He's so strong and powerful that one of the only things he can't do is make a rock so heavy that he can't lift it. Because that would be logically impossible. He can make a, an extremely heavy rock. But no matter how heavy he makes the rock, he's always going to be able to lift it. He's all powerful. So he says, come unto me, all ye that labor. One of the Lord's favorite words is come. He's giving you an invitation. Our friend persuades you uh, to come. He wants every man to come to repentance. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And in 1 Timothy 2, 4, he says, Who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Jesus wants everybody to be saved. It's his will for everybody to be saved. Uh, when Noah finished the ark in Genesis 7, 1, the Lord said, Come. He says, Come now, and all thy house unto the ark. In Isaiah 1, 18, he says, Come now, and let us reason together. At the rapture, the Lord will say, Come up hither. 
You see, we have a friend who persuades. He says, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. He wants you to take his yoke on you. The yoke is shaped like a cross. And in Matthew 16, 24, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. The Lord wants hard workers. It's hard work carrying the cross. But the Lord's hard workers have rest for their souls. Maybe not so much for their body, but they have rest for their souls. And that's something the lost world doesn't have because Revelation 14, 11 shows there is no rest for the souls of evil workers. Not in eternity. In Revelation 14, 11, they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. And the smoke of their torment will ascend up forever and ever. There is no rest for the wicked, but there's rest for the souls of those that follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says in Matthew eleven thirty, For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Our friend is persuading you to come and work with him. His yoke is easy because when you can't pull anymore, he starts pulling all the weight. His burden is light because he carries it all on his back. It's like when you help a, a few strong people carry a couch. You ever help like a, a few other guys carry a couch that were really strong? They're really doing all the heavy lifting. You just have your hands under it. That's the way it is when you work with Jesus. He, he does all the heavy lifting for you. You just have your hands under there. You just have your body under there carrying it. But that's our friend. Matthew 11, what a friend we have in Jesus. He is our friend. He's the best friend you have. He's your best friend. 